sharp saw is such a joy to use. My name is Frank Strazza with the Heritage School of Woodworking, and in this video, we're going to talk about how to sharpen, recondition a saw. We're going to talk about the different types of saws. I'm going to show you a saw that most people might be more familiar with. You can both see and hear the difference in this saw. I think most woodworkers would be familiar with a saw like this. Maybe a saw that's been sitting around in the garage or the attic, uh, one that hasn't been sharpened. The key though is they must be sharp. They've got to be razor sharp in order to cut like this. And in this video, I'm going to show you how we recondition and sharpen a saw. I'd like to start by going over some of the different tools that you'll need to uh, sharpen a saw. Any saw can be sharpened in either one of two configurations, either a rip configuration or a cross-cut configuration. And I have different saws here, a dovetail saw, a tenon saw, we have a couple different cross-cut saws and rip saws and such. Again, the only thing that denotes the difference between whether it's a cross-cut or a rip is how the teeth are configured, that is how they're sharpened. In order to sharpen a saw, we're going to need some files, triangular type files. Uh, depending on how bad the saw is, we may need a flat file such as this to joint the teeth. We'll go over that in a second. And we'll need a saw set. I've got two types of saw sets here. I've got one for small teeth and then one for larger teeth. So two types of saw sets. And last but not least, we will need a saw vise, something to hold the saw. This vise enables us to hold the saw right up close to the teeth, right up right at the edge of the teeth, which keeps it from vibrating. There are several steps to sharpening a saw, rather reconditioning a saw. If you're going to recondition a saw, oftentimes you have to start by jointing the top of the teeth. That is making the teeth level and straight as you look down. If you look down this saw, you can see that the teeth are not perfectly straight. As you can see, there's a high spot here. It might lower a little bit right in there, maybe come up there. So that's the first step is to joint the teeth. The next step is shaping the teeth after they're jointed. I'll do an illustration here on the whiteboard to show you what I mean. If we have a series of teeth like this, I'm just going to draw some on here, small ones, big ones. The first step, as I mentioned, is to joint the top of the teeth. So you've got to go across and bring them all to a consistent, as bringing them all down uh, to the lowest point. Sometimes you'll have to do this in multiple steps as we probably will have to do on this saw. But as you can see now, we've got all of the teeth all level, jointed. So as I mentioned, the next step is to shape the teeth and that is to bring all the teeth to, the even, to an even size. So when I file this, I'm going to take off half of this tooth and half of this tooth. So I'm going to bring this down to where this comes even, then we're going to take half of this tooth, and obviously here, we're not going to take any off of this side. So the shaping process is probably the most difficult process because what you have to do is alter the pressure with your file as you're filing along. Essentially, with this, I would put fairly equal pressure with the file on both sides of the tooth. On this one, I'm going to have to put quite a bit of pressure on this side over here and no pressure over here because I want to take off this metal, bringing this down even. Over here on this one, we're going to have to bring this one down. So lots of pressure on this side, but no pressure over here. Again, our goal is, is to bring the bottom of the gullet, this is the gullet down on the bottom, bringing all of these level and all of the tops of the teeth all level across. After you shape the teeth, the next step is to set the teeth, and that's where the saw set comes in. Every single saw, whether it's a rip saw or a crosscut saw, has set to the teeth. 
That is where one tooth is bent one way and then the other tooth is bent the other way. So essentially when you look down the saw, it looks like this. You have teeth bending in alternating directions. All, uh, every other tooth is bent in one direction, every other tooth bending back the other way. The purpose for the bend or the set in the teeth is when you're cutting, it allows for the, the back of the saw to go through. It allows for the saw to be able to cut through the wood. If you don't have any set in the teeth, the saw will bind. It depends what kind of wood you're going to be cutting and what you're doing with the saw will depend on how much set you put in the teeth. If I was cutting green wood or a soft wood, a fibrous wood, I would want more set in the teeth. If I'm cutting hard wood, want less set. If I'm cutting dovetails, where I'm cutting in a hard wood usually and only cutting down a little ways, I want very, very little set. That's going to give me a finer cut, not as aggressive, not as big a curve. Once we set the teeth, the final step is sharpening, which is almost like shaping the teeth, but when you sharpen the teeth, what you're doing is you're going an even stroke on every single tooth. For the shaping and the sharpening, we're going to use files, and I have here several different files. Again, these are all triangular shaped, triangular shaped files, 60 degrees, three-sided, and we've got different sizes here from the small all the way up to the largest. I'm going to explain what we have here. We've got a four inch, these are four inch files right here. These are six inch files and these are seven inch files right in here. The main difference between these two files is one is called a double extra slim and then one is an extra slim file. So we have double extra slim, extra slim uh, in the four inch. In the six inch we have a double extra slim and an extra slim in the six inch. And in the um, seven inch file we have, I've got to read on here and see, but I believe this is just a, a extra slim and what we would refer to as a slim taper file. Obviously the, the slim taper seven inch file being the largest, the double extra slim four inch file being some of the smallest. The idea when choosing a file is for the file to fit about one-third into the tooth. When you sharpen a saw, you want to be able to use all three sides of this file over multiple sharpenings. In other words, the file is going to dull over time. So I'm, I could get maybe three or four sharpenings out of this side of the file, three or four sharpenings out of that side of the file, and turn it three or four sharpenings out of this side of the file. That is if only one third of the tooth goes into the file. Let me do an illustration on the board to help illustrate that point. So here's the tooth, right like this. Again, that should be approximately 60 degrees. Here's the file setting inside of that tooth. Hopefully we can draw this correctly here. So that's essentially not a perfect triangle, but you get the idea. So what we have here, this is the top of the tooth, this is the top of the tooth here, obviously another tooth back here this way, um, but we have one-third of the file set inside of the tooth. That way, when we're sharpening, we're essentially not dulling all of the file. If I was using too small a file, say the file came up to here, I would be dulling this part of the file and I wouldn't get as much use out of the file. I'd like to explain the difference between a crosscut saw and a rip saw. There's a couple different angles and sometimes these angles can be a little bit confusing when you're looking at a saw, when you're sharpening a saw. The rip saw is probably the least confusing of the two. As you can see, there's a little bit more geometry going on in the crosscut saw. The rip saw has a couple different angles. One is referred to as the rake angle. And that's this angle right here. If you'll follow along, if you'll follow along right here, you'll see 
this angle here. That's the angle that leans back towards the handle. That's referred to as the rake angle. I can adjust the rake angle depending on the, how aggressive I want the saw to cut. So if I want a more aggressive saw, I can raise the rake angle forward like this. That is bringing it up to maybe zero degrees or so. If I want a less aggressive saw, I can actually lower the rake angle down to, in most cases, 10 degrees. I have found, though, that by changing the rake angle by just a couple degrees can really affect how aggressive the saw cuts. So if your saw is kind of cutting too aggressive, you can actually change the rake angle. Bring it down to maybe 12 or 13 degrees. Lower, relax that rake angle down like this. It'll make a more smoother cut. This angle here obviously will follow this angle because it's essentially 60 degrees right inside here. The other thing with a rip saw is that it's just filed straight across. That is perpendicular to the face of the blade. So it's just 90 degrees straight across like this. So the only thing we really have to worry about here is the rake angle and then just filing straight across. The rips, the crosscut saw also has a rake angle. The rake angle generally on a crosscut saw is a little bit more than a rip saw. It's generally about 15 degrees. So you see here this angle is relaxed back, again back towards the handle, about 15 degrees. The main difference between a crosscut saw and a rip saw is on a crosscut saw you have what we call the fleam angle. Looking down on top of the saw, you can see that there's this angle right here. Instead of it being filed 90 degrees, you have a fleam angle. That's filed at an angle like this. Okay, that's generally that can vary as well. It can vary depending on what kind of wood you're cutting. If you're cutting a hard wood, you don't need as much of a fleam angle. You'd want a little bit less, maybe 10, 15 degrees. If you're cutting a soft wood, you're gonna want more of a fleam angle. So maybe 20 degrees or so. Generally 20 degrees is fairly standard for a crosscut saw for the fleam angle. The other thing when filing a crosscut saw is because the teeth are bent in two directions, while well, obviously this one's gonna be going this way, this one's gonna be going back that way, you want the point to be facing out. So in this case, I would want this saw, this tooth rather, bent out this way, this tooth bent out that way. So when I file, I'm gonna file every other tooth on the crosscut saw. So I'm gonna file here, here, and here. We're gonna start by reconditioning a rip saw. I think the rip saw is the easiest of the two to start on to show you how to sharpen. And um, with the rip saw, With the rip saw, you actually file every single tooth, and again, just straight across like that. One thing that you'll find different between each of these saws is the points per inch. That is, how many points uh, measure to an inch. Sometimes that information can be found on the on the saw right down close to the edge and sometimes it's difficult to see if you catch it just right in the light in this case this is a 10 points per inch saw there's 10 points to an inch if i took a ruler put it on there you can count 10 points that points per inch will determine what size file i use and if you look in the resources tab down below you will see the um, specifications for which files to use for points per inch. I usually just do it by eye. You can take a, a file and set it in the tooth and usually you can see it. If you set it right inside there, you can see which size file works well. This might be a little bit large. We might go back to, and this was the six inch extra slim, but let's find the six inch double extra slim. That looks pretty close. In fact, I'm finding that that's maybe a little bit 
this file might be a little bit too small for this saw. So in fact, I may actually have to go back to the, the six inch slim taper file. I would say that for most saws, you'll find that the six inch uh, slim taper and the six inch double extra slim taper files are gonna do for most of your sawing. The four inch files come in when you're dealing with much smaller tooth patterns, such as this one here. You might be looking at maybe a 16 teeth per inch. And as you can see, the teeth are much finer. And this is a dovetail saw, so typically a dovetail saw is gonna be sharpened for rip. Let's begin by sharpening, or in this case, reconditioning this saw. As I mentioned earlier, the first step is to joint the teeth. Before we joint the teeth here, I wanna mark the teeth so I can know which tooth I filed. Some people use a magic marker. I actually like to use this steel blue layout fluid. Nice thing about this is it flows into the tooth so you can tell which tooth you filed as you're working along. You've gotta watch, this stuff will stain everything that you're working on, so I like to put it away from the bench so I don't stain my bench blue, and we'll just brush this on. Again, check out the resources tab below for a list of suppliers where these items can be obtained from. I'm just putting a very little bit on there, and I know it's dyeing the saw blue, but a little denatured alcohol will take that right off. This really helps in defining which tooth you have filed. It makes a big difference. So let's put this in the, in the saw vise, and we're gonna start by jointing the teeth. There's a couple ways to do this. You can simply run a file flat across the top of the teeth uh, like this, but you've got to watch because I've often been running the file along and if my hand falls forward and the file pushes it in, it can cut your finger. It doesn't feel very good. So there's a couple things to aid in that. You can use a block of wood with the file set in it and that'll, that helps in a couple ways. It helps keep it square. Just take a rubber hammer here and tap it in place and that helps keep the file square to the edge and you can run that along just like so. Always push the file and you'll see here the file is jointing the teeth. If you look right on top you can see that there is uh, some flat spots. It's hitting right there, right there, and this is jointing. There's one right there. It's jointing the teeth. You can see right there. So ideally We'd want there to be a flat spot. We're not gonna take all the teeth all the way down, but ideally we would see that the file had touched every single tooth, and we would know that it was perfectly jointed all the way across. This saw is in pretty bad shape, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna probably joint it a little ways, because again, I don't wanna take the teeth all the way off. We'll joint it a little ways, and then we'll start shaping it. Then we'll probably joint it again. So let's just joint over here. There's a high spot right up in there. So we're gonna come in here like this and just joint this. Sometimes you can find these on the used market. This is actually a saw jointer. Its main purpose was for jointing the top of a saw. It's aluminum, nice little file holder here, and it's designed to keep your hand away from the blade. So we can just run that right along the top. Again, I'm working over here because that's the high spot. We'll just work this right along, just like so. I'm gonna have to raise this in the vise just a little bit because the jointer is hitting the saw vise. Again, that tooth, we're gonna bring that tooth way down. Let's bring that down just a little bit more. I'm gonna go back to using this guy because I want a little bit bigger file. I prefer to use an eight inch 
flat file because it's obviously a longer file. This holder will not hold an eight inch file, just hold a six inch file. So really a homemade uh, saw jointer might be better. We're gonna bring this down and that tooth right there is what's high again, working it down. Let's inspect the progress here. We can see flat right there, obviously a higher spot right over here. Let's continue to work it down again. Let's just work this all the way down like this. Let's sight down this saw and see what kind of progress we're making. Uh, it looks like when I sight down this saw, you can see that there's a curve right inside there. I don't really like that. Uh, most of the teeth are coming down pretty level, which is, which is nice, but I would prefer there not to be a curve in the saw like that. I'm gonna go ahead and shape the teeth now instead of jointing it perfectly flat. The reason why is if I keep on jointing, I'm gonna start losing the teeth, which in this case are my point of reference, and then I'd have to retooth the saw, and we'll save that for another video. I'm gonna use a six inch double extra slim taper for this saw. This is about uh, 10 to 12 points per inch for this saw, um, and I've got here a little, simple little holder that I made to help me uh, denote the perfect rake angle. All this is is essentially a block of wood with a 10 degree line drawn on this piece. So I've got a 10 degree angle. That's gonna point back towards the handle. And all I've gotta do is put my file inside there, line up this edge of the file with that 10 degree line and tap it in. Now when I file along, this will actually help keep it perfectly flat. As long as I keep this perfectly flat, I know that that rake angle is gonna remain at 10 degrees. So you can see right here, we filed quite a bit of, away, almost taking the teeth away. So in this case, I'm going to come in and I can see a little tiny faint line there. Let's just kind of work there. We'll start by shaping the teeth. Now, when you've heard of saw, sharpening a saw, you've probably heard, well, you've gotta go an even stroke on each tooth. This is true when sharpening a saw, but as I showed earlier in that illustration, when shaping the teeth, we may have to take more than one stroke Oftentimes, multiple strokes on one tooth, and maybe the next tooth we may not have to take any strokes on. Again, our goal is, is to take those flats away, getting rid of those flats. I'm gonna adjust the, the pressure of the file based on which flats I'm trying to remove. You can see right here where we have a flat right there and a flat right there. In that case, I'm gonna put equal pressure on either side of the file, just straight down, and we should be able to remove half of the flat over here, half of the flat over there. And there you can see there's a little bit of a flat, a little bit of a flat. Let's work this one down just a little bit more. This part right back in here, I'm gonna take a flat file and just take it at an angle right in here like this, bring it off. So now you can see we've got that work down and we're gonna keep on working across these teeth, shaping them as we go. This one here, I don't see any flat on the top, but I see a little flat over there, so I'm gonna take gentle pressure, putting pressure on this side of the file. Just light pressure. Now there's nothing there. This one here, we're gonna have to work it 
because there's a flat on this side, but not on that side. So let's work it a little bit more. Now I'm only taking half of the flat off because I'm gonna move to the next one and take half the flat on this side. Move to the next tooth and all the way down. You can see clearly which teeth I've filed because when you file, it files away that bluing that we put on there, that steel blue layout fluid. When I'm shaping the teeth, you can see right here there's an even flat on this tooth and an even flat on this tooth. With that, when I file this, I'm going to put equal pressure on both sides and go straight down, essentially only taking off half the flat. Of course, I've already taken off part of the flat on this tooth. So I'm only going to take off half the flat on this one and try to take off the rest of the flat on this one. This next tooth, you'll see, we're going to have to file half of this and then half of that. So that's fairly equal. Pressure straight down. Next one, you can see here, a little bit of a flat there, more of a flat there. So I'm gonna put a little more pressure on that tooth, less pressure on this one. So more forward pressure with my file that way. This tooth here, we're gonna put a lot more forward pressure this way because there's not much of a flat on the top there, but more of a flat on the top there. You can see when we worked, when we topped the top of these teeth, the file didn't hit it all right there, but a little bit right on that one. So again, we're gonna put pressure leading this way and not much back here. Again, our goal here is to bring all of these teeth down to a consistent height. That is to where they're all leveled out. Sometimes I'll work alternating teeth. I'll work this tooth a little, then I'll come back to this tooth, especially when there's a large flat on there because I want to make sure that we bring it down evenly on each side. I'm putting put pressure this way to get rid of that flat. We're almost done with this preliminary shaping. You can see we're just nearing the last few teeth. And then we're gonna go back and rejoint it. This last tooth, I wanna come back with the flat file and just come along here flat like this. Now we're ready to remark it. We're gonna use the layout fluid, remark the teeth, and then joint it again. One thing to keep in mind when hitting a file, make sure you use a rubber mallet. Files are very hard and they can break. They're brittle, so tap it lightly. Now we'll joint the top of the teeth. I've marked it and we'll joint it. It'll expose which teeth need to be shaped again.
there's a little bit of a concavity to the saw and I want to work that out. So I'm gonna focus my attention on either end of the saw. I'm gonna sight down the saw. That's looking better. We'll work it more over here. I can see quite a bit of flat spots there. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to take the teeth all the way out because then I've lost my point of reference with the teeth. So I want to join it a little ways. And you can see more flat spots here now that we've shaped it and we're getting it flatter. So let's work this down just a little bit more over here. Flat, flat, actually we've got a flat on most all the teeth. Let's take a look at it. That's much better. I've done the final jointing and I'm quite happy with how it looks. It's much straighter now. Nice and straight all along the length. And what you'll also see is you'll also see that the flats on the top of the teeth are more even. So they're nice and even. As you look around, you'll see right there, all the whites are all the same. So we're gonna shape it one more time. The real, the only difference between the shaping process and the joint and the sharpening process is with the shaping, we're taking each individual tooth down to match the others. In other words, we're trying to take away the flats to bring it equally. So really what we're doing is we're taking maybe more strokes on one tooth, less strokes on another tooth, whereas with sharpening, we're taking an even stroke on every single tooth. So essentially, um, shaping the teeth and sharpening are the same. The key here is to keep the file 90 degrees to the face of the saw. Also, we want to keep the file perfectly flat to the top of the, of the saw as well. You'll want to make sure that you use a sharp file when sharpening your saw. <laughs> the files do wear out and they become dull over time and it's frustrating using a dull file. So make sure that the file is sharp. It'll cut much better. We're on the last few teeth of this shaping process. I'm just going to continue on and we'll move on to the next step. When you file a saw, you're creating a burr with the file. That means you're pushing a burr. That's when, when one surface meets the other, you form a little metal burr. I wanna take that burr off, but the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna coat the saw again with the, with the layout fluid, and then we're gonna take that burr off. I'll show you how that's done.
I'm gonna go ahead and remove the burr by cutting in a piece of hardwood. It's not gonna cut very good because the saw is, is not sharp and it's not set, but I'm just basically running it in a piece of scrap hardwood and a few strokes will remove the burr. In fact, what we'll be able to see is if we sight on top of the saw, we'll be able to see a little white reflection right off the top, right there. You can see that it's a little white reflection. And that means that I have not gone all the way down with the file. In other words, we actually have to shape the teeth again. And at this point, depending on how bad those flats are, these flats, I might just come back and the flats that are uh, wider, we'll sh just shape those and we'll leave the rest for the sharpening process. It actually doesn't look too bad. Now that we've done the final shaping, we're now gonna move on to setting the teeth. The reason why we have to reset the teeth is because we filed so much away. The teeth are like this, and we have actually filed it, filed it, filed it down to where we removed most of the set. So I'm gonna come back and reset the teeth using a saw set. We've got two types of saw sets. The only difference between these two is the plunger. You can see the little plunger you can see the little plunger right in here. This is a bigger plunger. That's what pushes the tooth. And this one here is a smaller plunger right there. That's what pushes the tooth to the side. So let's see which uh, saw set fits this saw. If you look down in here, you can see that the plunger is somewhat larger than the tooth. In that case, I really want to go with the smaller saw set. You can see right there, the plunger is a little bit smaller than the tooth and that will allow me to be able to bend the tooth over. First of all, we got to set the amount of set that we want using the, the saw set. I'm adjusting the saw set. The saw set is, a, is numbered from four all the way up to 12. So we're gonna raise this up, maybe to around a seven. Those numbers really don't denote a specific teeth per inch necessarily. The, all that these numbers are suggesting is a size. So essentially we're going from large to small. So if you want more set to the teeth, you're gonna set it on uh, a four or something like that. If you want to set less set on the teeth, then you're going to go with something in the upper number, a 10 or a 12. I'm going to shoot somewhere in the middle. Um, let's look and see how, how a seven looks. It doesn't, in this case, it doesn't, on a rip saw, it doesn't really matter which tooth we push to one side or the other. Generally, I try to look at the saw and see if the tooth is already going in one direction, then I'll just go ahead and follow in that same pattern. We filed this saw so much that we've pretty much lost all the set, so it really doesn't matter which tooth we start on. We just wanna do every other tooth. So we'll just begin here and start pushing these teeth to one side. I have had some of these older saws where a tooth will actually break off and that's always a uncomfortable feeling when you're 
setting the saw and you hear a little break. And that's oftentimes from the saw just being brittle, the teeth being brittle. It's because it's been sitting out or getting a bit rusty. It'll tend to be more brittle. Now we're ready to set the saw. And I'd like to talk about the difference between these two saw sets. This is a fine saw set. And if you look on the inside, you can see the little plunger difference between the two. There's a little plunger right inside there that pushes the tooth to one side. There's the plunger right there. And that pushes the tooth. And then there's this one. This plunger is just a little bit larger. So there's also numbers on here. These are adjustable by loosening up this part right there. You can see this wheel right in here turns, and that denotes how much set you'll put into the saw. I believe those numbers run from 4 all the way up to around 12 or so. All those numbers are is just a grading system, so essentially 4 is going to be more set, 12 is going to be much less set. So we're going to go with somewhere in between. Let's try both of these and see which one looks best in the, in the saw. If I put the small plunger on there, it works. Uh, I could actually get away by sh setting the saw using this saw set. But on a couple teeth, there may be a problem where the, uh, you might find that the plunger may actually push to the side of the tooth. So maybe a bigger plunger would be a little bit better, something that covers the whole tooth, as long as it's not too big and doesn't interfere with the other teeth. So in the, with this, I think I'll go with this one just because it's a little bit bigger and it's going to cover that whole tooth and enable that whole tooth to push to the side, as opposed to the smaller one where it could actually slide off of the tooth maybe. The other thing when you're trying to set this saw is make sure that the pressure is down. Sometimes the saw set wants to ride up a little bit. The, the plunger inside there is actually angled like this. So what happens is sometimes the saw set wants to ride up like this. Make sure there's pressure down on the saw set. And then of course there's a little, um, a little clamp that engages first. So that little clamp will actually go against the saw. So I'm putting pressure down, clamp against the saw, and then the plunger then comes and pushes the tooth to the side. Well, we're finishing up this side of the setting of the saw, and we'll now flip it over and set all the teeth, the, every other tooth, going the other way. So when we set it the first time, we set every other tooth going this way. Now we're going to flip the saw around and do every other tooth going the other way. I've set my saw set here on a number eight, which is somewhere in between. It'll actually do, it's a finer set. And uh, this saw is a nice fine tooth pattern. So it'll make a nice fine kerf. And uh, I can feel it there. It's a, it's a nice gentle set. It's ideal once you start setting the teeth not to stop. It's easy to go cross-eyed doing this as well. But you don't want to lose your place. I'm nearing the end here of setting the second side, the last few teeth, and we will be ready for sharpening. Before I sharpen the saw, I'm going to coat it one more time so I can tell which tooth that I've filed away. So again, coating it with the layout fluid. Now we're ready to begin sharpening. 
As I mentioned earlier, the shaping process is much like the sharpening process. The main difference being when sharpening, we want to have an even stroke on every single tooth. Even stroke, even pressure, um, an even number of strokes too. So if I choose to do one stroke, I want to do one stroke on every tooth. If I choose to do two strokes, which in this case, I think I'm going to go ahead and do two strokes because there are still a few, um, just a little bit of a flat left and I want to get rid of that. Essentially, if you've watched my other videos on chisel sharpening, you know that what defines a sharp edge is having two highly polished points coming to infinity. In this case, it's not going to be highly polished, it's just the use of a file, but we still want both of those points coming to infinity. So we don't want any flat spot on the top of, of the tooth. Again, I'm lining up the rake angle with the, the back with the handle. And we'll do two strokes per tooth. One thing you want to keep in mind when filing the saw is that you want the file to be perpendicular to the face, that is 90 degrees to the face of the saw. Also, we want the file to be level with the top of the saw as well. So I oftentimes look to the side to just make sure that the file is indeed level, um, 90 degrees to the saw, both in this plane as well as this plane. Don't apply too much pressure, just allow the file to do the work. Okay, we're almost done with the sharpening process. The last few teeth here. I've tried to maintain even pressure, even number of strokes. And if you follow all of that correctly, then the teeth should be all the same size. I'm just going to take a file right on the end here and work this the last tooth right there. Just like that. Okay, let's try it out. Well, I think it cuts a lot better than it did before we started. One of the uh, things that uh, some people like to do is they'll sharpen every other tooth from one side and then every other tooth from the other side. And the reason why is they say that it puts the burr on one side. When you file the saw with, with the file, um, you're pushing a burr to one side. So I filed this saw with the handle to my left so it pushed the burr over on this side and when I, ha I have to do a few strokes with the saw to wear that burr off. So you may find that the saw may veer a little bit to one side, and if that's the case, it's oftentimes because the burr could be pulling it off. Usually a couple strokes and the burr is gone. I like to work it from one side because as I file from one side going straight, it's easier for me to maintain the angles and such because I'm right-handed, I can maintain even pressure on every single tooth. So let's try it again. Let's see if we can get a cut that's a little bit straighter. And I 
Now that saw is working well. This saw was in pretty bad shape before we started, and most saws aren't going to be this bad. Uh, this saw probably took about two hours total time to restore it. Um, if you've got a saw that's not that bad, it really shouldn't take too long. The processes are still the same, you just won't have to spend as much time. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to comment below, and I hope uh, you enjoyed the video and that you can sharpen your saws and enjoy a sharp tool.